Today's topic is interesting because I get a lot of questions around milk. And the question was, you know, what is your thoughts on milk? And I said, I don't really have any thoughts. My <laughs> whole philosophy in life is to be evidence-based and not opinion-based. So anytime I tell you something, if the evidence changes, I'll come back and say, look, that's what the evidence shows and that's why we don't believe in it. That's similar to very controversial topics like what's your take on the ketogenic diet? What's your take on saturated fat? How does saturated fat play a role in terms of fatty liver? All sorts of really interesting concepts. So milk is one of those things that it's fascinating how little people actually understand about milk. So with that, let me share a little bit with you. It is research heavy, but I'll try to make it so that it's applicable to what you guys are. And then at the end, I'll make sure I summarize everything for you guys. So let's get started on this fun little journey today on milk. So there's nothing like looking at the origins of something, right? And so you start to look at the origins of milk and you're like, who was the first person ever in the whole wide world, in the history of mankind, to drink milk, nobody knows. I never met the person, I don't have the fossil records, but what we do know is somewhere between 9,000 to 7,000 BC was probably where milk really started to come into usage. And what was fascinating was even though it came into usage, people at that time lacked the enzyme. So the question is how were they really using it? And if they were, they probably had the worst stomach upsets ever, but they did. and. About 3,000 to 5,000 years ago is when really we start to see the allele for lactase start to come up. Now that's only in Europe. If you look at Europe today, about 90% of people in Europe still have it, but like my wife who's Vietnamese, she can't drink milk. It's just one of those things where it's really uncommon in Asia and South America. But the question is, why the heck did people started drinking milk? And really, was it because there was a risk of starvation and they saw that as something that was accessible? Was it because it was a new source of nutrients? Let me go ahead and end the excitement on that question. Nobody knows. But what we do know is how people use milk today. So what are the trends like? Well, what's fascinating is, is the consumption of milk has been going down steadily. And as a result of it, as you know, with every fast food industry, they have pushed cheese into every single thing they sell. This is why you'll see that cheese is so predominant because of the fact that they had all this milk and they don't know what to do with it. Now, what's really interesting if you look at that graph is look at what's increasing, low fat milk, right? So people are obsessed with this concept of trying to do low fat. So they feel like if they go from whole milk, which in their mind is 100% fat, right, to low fat like 2%, oh my God, I got rid of 98% of the fat. Well, whole milk is about 3.5% fat. So going from 3.5% fat to 2% fat isn't really rocket science. All they basically do is increase the volume. That volume can be added things like sugar, or it can be added things like good old water, and that can go ahead and reduce the amount of fat that's present. It's just a concentration issue. Then when you think about average annual consumption in 1996, Average, people were drinking about 24 gallons a year, and now it's gone down to about 17 gallons. But really, the question is, is how the heck did we come up with this concept of what is it that you need for quote unquote calcium slash milk consumption? This is really fascinating, right? Who came up with this? Well, it turns out that what was thought to be adequate calcium intake was derived from one single study, one study that had about 155 people and they looked at them for only 18 days. So think about that for a second as you think about all of the weight and all of the faith we have in calcium consumption and milk and dairy and things like calcium intake and bone health, it was all derived from a single study. And what they found was that, you know, even in nephrology, if you heard my kidney talks on nutrition, what we talk about is what is a neutral balance, which basically says is that's what your body will go ahead and take in and maintain. So what you're putting out, what you're going out ends up being the same because of the fact that you're now in a steady state. So for that neutral balance part, it was about 741 milligrams per day. There's only one problem with that statement is when you looked at the people and there was only 155, their intakes were so variable. They were between 415 to 1740 milligrams per day. And so this makes it very difficult to say how we came up with this recommendation in three weeks. And the second part of that is, is 
what does that translate into? So in other words, if somebody did get 741, what does that mean in terms of the risk of fractures to come and so forth and overall mortality and et cetera? More to come, but that sets up the stage. Now, what's really interesting is, is the current recommendation of how much milk you ought to be drinking and what's kind of preached out there is actually a lot higher than what people are already drinking. There's a massive shift away from dairy already, but there's a shift that the industry is really hoping for, for things like cheese. Now let's take a look at composition of milk. This is really fascinating, right? So milk has over 50 hormones in there that are designed for the newborn calf development. And that's how it was designed, right? Just like breast milk is designed for our newborns. And there's a very good reason why it's designed for that. Same thing for cow's milk. There's a very specific reason. So in order to increase milk production, what the farmers end up doing is, is they try to inbreed the cows so that they can have higher productions of IGF-1. And on the previous data that I've presented in the past, what I've shown is IGF-1 is linked to things like breast cancer, to things like higher risk, not causality, but risk of things like prostate cancer also. And so in order to constantly produce milk, unfortunately, they have to keep the cows pregnant. And so what that means is they end up having significantly higher levels of things like progestin and estrogen. And what I want you to notice is that the table on the right side of the screen that basically compares human milk, whole fat cow's milk, fat-free cow's milk, and cheddar cheese. And what's fascinating is, is as in a society, we are obsessed with protein. Yet if you look at human milk, look at the concentration in grams that's found of protein in human milk versus things like cow's milk, etc. That's actually a really, really fascinating phenomenon. The other thing that ends up being pretty interesting on this one is really the saturated fat component, right? So on human milk and on things like cow's milk also, the amount of saturated fat is higher. But here's the caveat to everybody who argues for the keto diet based on the saturated fat component. Yes, it's higher in newborns for, I'm sorry, in um, human milk and cow's milk. And what we know with very good data, this is not correlation data, this is causation data where we can show that if you have diets high in saturated fat, you actually develop fatty livers quite rapidly. This is in human studies and this is in animal studies. In fact, if you compared everything, protein, carbohydrates, and saturated fats, saturated fats are more likely to give you the fatty liver than any of the other macronutrients that are present. Then let's look at hip fractures, right? What's the correlation between countries that have the highest, now remember correlation is the word, not causation. But what is the correlation for countries that have the highest amount of milk intake and hip fractures? It's kind of interesting to look at this, this fascinating slide that basically shows more or less a linear correlation. In other words, the more milk consumption you end up having is the higher risk. Yes, this is trying to control for all sorts of risk factors and its correlation. And could there be confounding variables that we haven't thought about? Yes, yes, and yes. And it is still really interesting to look at this. The other part is, is if you look at the data, lots and lots and lots of data that I reviewed, What's fascinating about this is, is higher amounts of milk consumption or dairy consumption that includes cheese is not linked to a lower risk of fracture prevention. And what about bone loss? Well, you know that calcium supplements, the sales exceed $1 billion and that was in 2015. They're much higher now. But what's fascinating is, is when you review all of this data, you find that really with calcium supplements, you do get an increase, but that increase is about 1% in bone density in the first year. After that, it's not like you get 1% every single year. And if you decide to stop taking the supplements, there's no lasting effect. So that 1% does go away. And that's a really interesting phenomenon when it comes to looking at what is the role of calcium intake and bone health. Now, what about growth? So a lot of people, including my parents and my wife's parents, you know, this it's all about my wife was very worried that my daughters are going to be short. I keep hearing this, that they're going to be short. And I'm like, listen, you know, if they're short, it's not like we're going to put them up for adoption, right? That's not what we do, right? 
And so you are who you are. Yes, you may be taller. Yes, you may be not. But the data on milk is interesting. If you drink milk, what you end up finding is, is that, yes, you're going to be a little bit taller. There's no doubt about it. And the mechanism for that really has to do with what's called branch chain amino acids. And so branch chain amino acids are one of these things that you need them because the majority of your muscles are composed of these three ones, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Yet at the same time, there are risks with overconsumption if you are into bodybuilding. Uh, bodybuilders use branch chain amino acids like they're candy simply because of the fact that they're linked to positive muscle growth. But the fascinating thing about also with milk is, is the whole concept of IGF-1, which keeps coming up. And remember, IGF-1 also mediates the actions of growth hormone. So that becomes really interesting. And the issue with branching amino acids really has to do with one. And that one branching amino acid that we really think about is leucine. And the reason for leucine is, of course, what? It turns on the mTOR pathway, which really has to do with not stopping cells from dying and really helping cells to continue to grow. So that's why a lot of the drugs that we use, for example, in transplant physiology have to do with blocking mTOR. So for this one, leucine is actually a good activator and that's a concern that we end up having in people who are athletes who are consuming BCAs like crazy. But once again, when you're an athlete, you're not really worried about 10, 20 years down the line. You're thinking about my next event that's happening in six weeks. And that's a huge problem, right? This is why teenagers and young adults often think they're invincible and don't need to take a flu shot. So I did this for my wife because <laughs> I wanted to show her that just because we talk about, you know, being tall is a good thing. It may not be such a great thing because if you're really, really tall, and this is just kind of tongue in cheek, but if you are really, really tall, it does increase the risk of things like cancers, fractures, and blood clots. But she still doesn't believe me and she still wants my daughters to be tall. So let's talk about weight loss. For a long time, there was all these uh, studies coming out on correlation data talking about if you had higher consumption of things like milk and dairy, and they thought maybe it's because of calcium, it would lead to weight loss. But what's fascinating is, is when you look at different studies, the ones that are well designed, you find that really it's not linked to weight loss. And the problem with correlation population-based studies is it's really hard to control for what else people are doing. For example, if you look at people who take multivitamins, so first of all, people ask me the question, should I take a multivitamin? Well, I used to say no, now I'm going to change that and say it really depends. And this is why. Does the data show that taking a multivitamin improve mortality? Absolutely not, right? There's no evidence that taking a multivitamin will actually help you to live longer. But, and this is a big but, the but portion is, is that the data also shows that people who take a multivitamin tend to also be a lot more health conscious and their self-perception of what they feel is that they're about 30% healthier. So they actually end up having a better outlook on life than people who don't take a multivitamin. So in other words, the placebo effect, remember the placebo effect can be as powerful as 30% of the actual outcomes, right? That's why the gold standard is a randomized, right? Placebo controlled trial, because you gotta know what is the net effect. You don't just want to know that drug A did this much. You want to know that drug A and placebo both did this much and drug A had this effect. So the net effect is what you want to know about. So that's where all of this stuff with things like population studies becomes very interesting. And even the multivitamin controversy is, is the question is, if you take a regular multivitamin, are you harming yourself? We're not talking the GNC super mega doses. We're talking about just a regular multi. That we don't have evidence to say that it would be harmful because we have studies extending as much as 20 years that show there wasn't any harm. But if you take overconsumption of fat soluble vitamins, certainly you'll get toxic levels from it. What about blood pressure? So if you look at blood pressure, you find that increasing dairy consumption or increasing higher amounts of uh, calcium in general in the form of cheeses or anything like that or milk, it doesn't really affect blood pressure or things like how well your vascular function works, so how well your blood vessels dilate or not. How about cholesterol? 
If you look at cholesterol, what we do know is once again, saturated fat, when it comes to cholesterol, will raise the cholesterol. This whole concept of how saturated fat affects your predisposition to getting diabetes, how saturated fat affects your predisposition to getting fatty liver is really fascinating, right? So the, the age old question is, is what causes diabetes? Is it high sugar or high fat? And so it's a one, two punch. The high fat goes inside the cells and creates insulin resistance. Then you got all the sugar floating around, which is causing micro and macrovascular damage going on. So fascinating here, when you start to look at things that are high in saturated fats, of course, your cholesterol will definitely go up. And on the flip side is things that are higher in monounsaturated, excuse me, and polyunsaturated fats, where your cholesterol ratio will actually get optimized. So then, when you look at lipid studies, what's really fascinating is, is there are so many studies that talk about things like dairy and how it lowers the risk of heart disease, right? So it's, it's really interesting that when you look at just the fact that who's funding these things, you'll find that it's a lot of industry sponsored. And as you guys know, you know, there was a um, uh, thing out recently where they were saying is if you publish an article and you want that article to be free, one of the premier journals out there said you can just pay them like 12,000 initially when you submit your article and therefore your article will be public access. As you guys know, right now, most studies are behind a paywall. So in other words, you want to access an article, it says something like $35 for one time access, right? You guys have all seen this. We use our librarians to go ahead and request the article. I do it. I think I'm like the only one who keeps our librarian in business. But we, we reach out to our um, librarians and we do that. But the paywall is there. So when you see free articles, you have to realize that it's very difficult. Journals need to constantly keep making money. Number two is journals need to put out enough stuff so their things like their alt metric or their relevance in terms of searches and popularity continues to go up. So it's good for them to be able to publish stuff that's a little bit controversial. But so many of these studies that I look at in nutrition are sponsored. And that's not to say like even guys like the avocado, you know, association does, they all do this, right? You'll read a study on avocado and, you know, somebody like me, I'm like, wow, I read 10 other studies and none of those about this and this one study does, how fascinating. Then I found out it's the Avocado Association, right? So you have to always be aware of who's sponsoring all of these studies. So let's look at dairy and, and heart disease. And what do we know? What we do know is that high fat dairy has a higher risk for developing heart disease, right? Now, th this is a really, really interesting sort of study because what they were able to do was look at what happens if you substitute certain things for other things. So instead of trying to go into all of this complicated details on the slide, the, the biggest thing is, is once again, red meat, red meat, red meat and processed meat, of course, continues to be the worst offender when it comes to risk for heart disease. So if you compare heart disease with one serving of red meat, if you switch from red meat, which is the worst to dairy, you lower your risk with me so far. So red meat, then dairy, then comes things like fish. So if you go from red meat all the way down to fish, you have a much better outcome. But once again, red meat gets classified as being the worst. Then is dairy, then is fish, and then is nuts. So should you have a little bit of nuts every single day? And the answer is absolutely yes, right? Just a handful of nuts. It doesn't matter what kind of nuts, just make sure they're plain. Mine is almonds because I love Trader Joe's and I just go there and I get these packets and this way every day I can have a packet of nuts. Then how about replacing dairy fat and heart disease? So what happens if you replace 5% of the energy that's coming from dairy, which is primarily saturated fat with polyunsaturated fats, which are nuts, beautiful reduction in heart disease, even vegetable fats reduction. But once again, what's the worst? Animal. So if you look at red and processed meats, dairy, right? Then you get to fish. Then you get to things like PUFAs, which are things like nuts.
How about type one diabetes and milk? What's the, the link? Is there any link? Should you care? So bovine insulin and human insulin are very interesting. The difference between the two of them is literally three amino acids. That's it, just three amino acids. So in this really interesting study, they had a population, they were looking at 200 infants. And what they were look, looking for was really these IgG antibodies and to see how do they react one with bovine insulin. And so the more they got exposed to cow's milk, the more they formed these antibodies. And the issue is sometimes those same antibodies that you're forming against bovine insulin can cross react with human insulin. Correlation, not causation, but we know that there has to be some kind of environmental trigger or triggers that lead to development of type one diabetes. And is cow's milk a possible link in that? Possibly, just something interesting to know. What about type two diabetes? So type two diabetes don't have data that shows that dairy consumption is linked to type two diabetes. And if you look at things like yogurt, you'll actually find the opposite effect. Now this makes it a little bit confusing is, is remember we talked about type two diabetes and we said it's that one two punch. You have higher intakes of things like saturated fats. They go inside the cells. They make it harder for the insulin to be able to act on the cells. You get insulin resistance with the first attack being coming from high fat, second attack coming from high sugars. So it's both that lead to diabetes going on. Now, other stuff to note really is once again, if you start to look at this stuff, Population studies, the difficulty that you run into population studies is it's hard to control for other variables. Like the nurse's health study. The nurse's health study looks at healthy nurses. These aren't people who have a lot of illnesses. These weren't people who were having diabetes already going on. And these are medical professionals. Same thing with the health professional study, right? So does this mean that this would generalize to the rest of the population? So whenever you get this conflicting data, the best thing to ask yourself is who is this population? And does this population generalize to the rest of the population? So for example, the age old debate, should you have eggs? should you not have eggs, right? So I did a whole talk talking about the differences between Europe and the United States and why in Europe, the studies that come out show that eggs are fine. But in the United States, studies come out showing that eggs will kill you. So will lots of other things, we're all gonna die. So it's interesting to see why Europe is better than us. Well, it's very simple is they sleep more, they move more, they have better social relationships than us, they're Quality of food may be crappy, but they do so many different things that actually add to the total concept of self. All right, milk and acne, right? So another interesting stuff. So this is not as strong of a study because once again, what are they doing? They're asking the teenagers, hey, have you ever had you know acne, blah, blah, blah. And then they're asking, what's your highest intake of dairy going on? How much were you thinking? And the correlation, not causation, but correlation was, you had a higher risk of acne in people who were getting more than three servings per day of things like dairy, not correlation. What about estrogen? So here's an interesting one. So in cow's milk intake, what they end up finding is, is in these particular people, they were looking at all sorts of things. So they were checking serum levels and they were doing urine levels in both men and women. And they were finding that there were higher um, levels of both estrone and progesterone. And then specifically in men, they were finding lower levels of things like testosterone in men. So it's a fascinating thing that occurs and then in women, what was also very interesting was that during the periods where they had the highest intakes of things like milk or dairy in general, that's when they were more likely to ovulate. So what was fascinating about this one was that the estrogen in milk, based on this data, really looks like it does get absorbed. And things like gonadotropin secretion probably is suppressed. And same thing with things like testosterone secretion. And so Ultimately, the concern for people who are younger is the question of what about things like sexual maturation of children? And could that possibly be affected by high intakes of milk? 
Now, it doesn't mean people are going to die and all that stuff like that. No, it's just something that's interesting to know. How about looking at links between breast, ovarian, uterine cancer and what do we find? So with milk, once we start to look at how closely milk is linked with things like breast cancer, it's pretty interesting. And then if you start to look at the incidence of milk consumption and you start to look at the incidence of breast cancer in countries, once again, it's kind of startling to see, and this is correlation, it's not causation, but it's very interesting to see higher amounts of milk and higher risk of breast cancer. And what was the link we talked about earlier? IGF-1. So really, other cancers like ovarian, like uterine, also have a higher link when it comes to things like cancer associated with milk consumption. And then milk plus cheese is really linked to things like uterine cancer. What about men? So we haven't forgotten about the men. How about prostate cancer, right? So if you look at highest versus lowest dairy intake in large population samples, once again, prospective studies, what do you find? The higher intake of dairy, the higher the likelihood of prostate cancer, and in other data, the higher the likelihood of prostate mortality. And then what about things like total mortality, right? If you start to look at total dairy intake and all-cause mortality, with all-cause, you don't necessarily see a link in data that's looked in Asia, US, Australia, and Europe. So it's a pretty broad group of uh, data sample. You don't see that link going on. But the conflict of interest, once again, comes very, very important because in these samples, what they were trying to say was, look, you know, we say that heart disease, cardiovascular disease doesn't. Earlier in the talk, I showed you other data that showed what heart disease, cardiovascular disease is higher with higher intakes of dairy. So why should you care? Because just look at who the funding for studies like this is. So if you looked at this study, you would say, wow, this is so exciting, right? I mean, look at this and, and this is such a broad study. It's Asia, it's US, Australia. Yet at the same time, look at all the people. And, you know, I, 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 I always want to not um, be uh, uh, mentioning brand names <laughs> in, in CME talks, but I can't help it. Like, there, there's a, um, a name down here that starts with an N, goes with an E and an S and a T and an L and an E, right? And I'm not going to say the name so I, I don't get into trouble again because I always get into trouble by some company. But it's really hard for me to see this. You know, there. this is a company that on the one hand produces every junk food known to mankind. And on the other hand, they have every product for going and getting coming out to talk about weight loss uh, drinks and shakes and meal replacement and all that. And they're always contacting me because somehow you know, I'm going to say, wow, you know, you guys are so amazing. And I have yet to say that. But it's really hard for me in good conscience to be able to look at this stuff and say, these are the same companies who push one thing and go another. And that's why some of this data that comes out, it just makes it so hard to look at this stuff. So here's another study. Once again, looking at nurses health study, health professionals follow up study. And guess what? Total mortality goes up. And what was their um, conflict of interest? <laughs> the Walnut Commission. So there you go. So those walnut people, man, they, they really want to make sure that you eat the walnuts and not the dairy. All right. So what happens if you once again think about this concept and you say, let's say you believe the data and you say, look, maybe there is a higher link between dairy and things like heart disease and other stuff. So what happens if you substitute one serving for things like nuts. It's beautiful. And what about whole grains? Beautiful. And what about red and processed meat? So as you're thinking about this, and as you're saying to yourself, you know, this is so much data, I'm totally confused. I want to make sure you get the basics. The basics is from an evidence-based perspective, the healthiest foods are plant-based foods. The worst foods for you happens to be red and processed meat. Does that mean you can never have red meat? No. If you have it once or twice a month, it's fine. Even if you have it once a week, the data still shows that it doesn't really impact you. 
and food by itself is not the only thing. If you're not sleeping enough, if you're stressed out all the time, if you're a smoker, if you're overweight, all of those things end up increasing your risk of all of these things occurring. But I'll tell you the most important component is the love component, which is about social interactions, which is expressing gratitude. You know, people always think that sounds hokey, but I'll tell you the data is so impressive, so fascinating. When you think about how important it is just to say thank you to somebody, just to do something kind for somebody. I tell you, you know, this work that I do with nutrition, what's fascinating about it is, you know, people always tell me they get a lot out of it, but I tell you, it gives me a lot of joy to do this work. My kids are so proud of the fact that their daddy does all this food stuff and you know he tries to go out and help people. All that stuff is good for my soul and hopefully it builds up some karma points because my wife is Buddhist and we're big believers in karma. But really think about it in very simple things. So look at the right side of this graph, processed meat. Then come all the way back and you'll get to fish. You know, with fish and chicken, it's very, very tricky, right? Based on the data that I've reviewed, I feel that fish is actually better than chicken is. And then we get to, of course, plant sources, which are the best. With fish, the only issue that we have is this concept of mercury that's starting to build up in our oceans, the microplastics that are starting to be found in fish more and more and more. And that's making it very difficult we don't know what the long-term impact of microplastics in us is going to be, but all this plastic that gets polluted into the ocean, it's actually finding its way back inside our bodies and our children's bodies. Now, organic and grass-fed. So, <laughs> so I always get this question about organic and grass-fed, right? Um, this is really interesting. So some of you guys may have heard of our best. And our best is the recombinant bovine somatotropin, right? So basically the whole thing about it is it's higher IGF-1, right? And the whole concept was they, they were doing this with cows to make cows produce more milk. That was the bottom line. Now here's really interesting. So one, there's no long-term studies that we have that say, hey, what happens with cows that were treated with our best with or without? But this is really interesting. The Canadian and European Union, they banned the sale of milk from our best treated in cows in 1990. Now you would be like, wow, they banned it, right? It must be because they wanted to protect humans. Uh-uh, had nothing to do with that. What they were worried about was there were all these problems that were occurring in the cows. The cows were developing mastitis. They had all sorts of fertility issues going on and they had all sorts of feed problems. So because of that, that was the only reason they ban our best. And so when you buy milk, if it doesn't specifically say that it does not contain our best, then guess what? It probably does contain our best because US does not require companies to label our best use on products. So when you're getting milk, it's a better idea to make sure it does say that. So that's where even if you get things like organic milk, most of the time organic milk does not contain our best. So bottom line, number one, if you're thinking that you absolutely need cow's milk because you're going back to the times of Mesopotamia 7000 BC, the answer is no, you don't need milk. If you like it, that's a different story. And I would even argue that if you look at like Mediterranean regions, they prefer goat's milk to cow's milk because it ends up having, well, obviously they don't know this, but scientists, I've studied this and found goat's milk actually has a lot lower amounts of things like IGF-1. Then in terms of fracture reduction, there isn't enough data to be able to come out and say that really consuming higher amounts of things like milk is gonna do that. And then for cancers such as prostate endometrial, there is a higher link. Interestingly, for things like colorectal cancer, it's actually a lower link. Now, dairy products, on the other hand, if you compare it to red meat, remember red meat is the worst, then goes dairy, and then goes other stuff like uh, fish, uh, chicken, and then below that, of course, is plant-based. And then really, if you think about reduced fat, 
2%, 1%, 0%, or whole fat. We don't have any data that clearly states that going from whole fat, which is 3.5%, to low fat, which is 2%, is going to make that much of a difference. And then don't forget good old things like kale, broccoli, tofu, nuts, and beans. Because if you're looking for calcium, nuts are awesome. Beans are awesome. Tofu is great. And if you're going to get tofu, remember, that's the one thing that I have to tell you to make sure it's organic. So very, very important. The one item that should be organic. Why? Because soy is the most genetically modified thing out there. And it's not because it's modified. Just about everything we eat is a GMO. If you actually wanted to go scientific and say how much of the foods we eat are, are GMO, you'd be shocked. But what happens is with soy, remember soy was what was fed to every single dairy animal. And the reason was, was because they were able to use that better than things like corn. They would grow stronger. They had less infections. So soy was actually fantastic for all of the animals from which all of the humans have been getting meat for. But because of things like insects and so forth, they wanted to make um, you know, the plants much more resistant to things like pesticides. So by genetically modifying them, they were able to do that. But as a result, the farmers spray pesticides like crazy. So when you get regular soy, unfortunately, there's so much pesticide exposure to it. So when people talk about, oh, you know, soy is GMO, that's not a valid argument. The valid argument is the use of how significant pesticides are being used. When you do uh, organic, you cut down that pesticide usage dramatically. It's not zero, it's a dramatic reduction. So that's why for tofu is the one thing that I always say, make sure you get organic.